Well, good evening. Welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church, and for many of you, welcome back to Bay Presbyterian Church. But for those of you who are just coming this evening, we welcome you. Glad that you're here. We kind of look at this as an opportunity to come when it's not quite so crowded as it is in the morning, and um, it's good for people who are immunosuppressed. So we're reaching everybody. Um, I just. Really, just a couple of announcements, a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, does everybody have one of these? Do we have enough to go around? Um, this is going to be important because all the words to the songs are on here. They're not going to be on the screens. Uh, the secretary didn't get to it this week, so um, I'm the secretary. Right? But words are on the back of, of your uh, little order of worship that you have there. Um, so that'll be important, and uh, the choir has a piece for us tonight. Thank you very much, Gordon, and choir. They worked very hard. They came at 5.15 tonight to prepare this for you. So um, that's, um, thank you very much for making that sacrifice. Here is one last uh, announcement. By authorization of Westminster Theological Seminary, I have been deputized as acting dean of the seminary. In that capacity, in that capacity, I am reinstating the commencement ceremony of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, May of 2022. And we continue here this evening at Bay Presbyterian Church. Mr. President, can you please come and share a few words concerning the decorum of this, this event here? Please. Um, oh. How's that look? It, it still fits. <laughs> the other part may not. Now, when a commencement service begins, it's very important that you understand the weightiness of what happens and that you conduct yourself properly. So I wanted to communicate some of the requirements. Number one, we are going back to antiquity. We are church historians at Westminster. So the conferring has to be in Latin. It can't be in just plain old English because we're scholars. So uh, when you see a diploma from Westminster, you know it's Latin. Nobody can read it, but you know it's scholarly, okay? <laughs> Number two, uh, when you confer a degree, it's important that you realize that you uh, are not to stand up in the way of the family that may be celebrating. The only people who are allowed to stand up with picture taking are members of the family. So if you're tempted to jump up and get a picture, make sure you're not in the way of anybody else that wants to honor their graduate. And then thirdly, the graduate, whoever it may or may not be, must not use a selfie stick for this historic moment. <laughs> this could cancel out your degree in perpetuity. So if you're out there and you don't pay attention, this could be serious. Well, uh, acting deputized dean, those are my announcements. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Right. So in my role as dean, I summon Ms. Rachel Diller, Director of Women's Ministry, to come forward. Uh, the degree was awarded to Rachel in absentia. Um, this past summer, uh, the Diller family drove north to Philadelphia in order to get her degree. Uh, Greg and Jean Poland were there. Greg was graduated at that time. Rachel was supposed to be graduated at that time, and she technically she was. But COVID uh, prevented her from receiving her diploma in person. So uh, with that, Mr. President, this candidate has completed the requirements for the degree of Master's of Arts in Counseling. She has been recommended by the faculty to receive this degree and approved by the Board of Trustees and are presented to you now for the conferring of the degree and the presentation of this diploma. I would like to ask our board member, Dr. Poland, to please join me for this very important moment. 
this stamp right here. Okay. Exitoritate Ordinus Curatorum Seminarii Theologici West Monasteriensis, Gradus Artium and Theologius Consuendo His Haminiba Datur. Madam Diller, please stand up here. Please come back. Uh, please come up here. Uh, deputize. We got to train this guy how to be a dean. He doesn't know what he's doing yet. He needs more instruction. You can't sit down on the president like that. He's still teaching. Okay, okay. Maybe, maybe you can at least hold my hand. Okay. There you go. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, as a custom of commencement, there are always awards that are given for extraordinary accomplishments. So it is my great honor this evening to unveil for the very first time the Deputized Dean Award for Excellence in Ministry <laughs> to be given to a Bay Presbyterian graduate by the name of Rachel Diller. So Rachel, on behalf of Westminster, here is a small award for your outstanding labors. And make sure you fill out the W-9 form and send it back. <laughs> And you can, <clears throat> you can use that for buying books or ministry or ice cream. Just remember to tithe to Bay or Westminster on whatever that word is, okay? Right. Let's give her out of it. Yeah. <laughs> he is remaining as deputized dean for some time. We don't know how long, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't cancel out yet. We might need him again. <laughs> I'm going to hang on to that as long as I can. I may need a job. <laughs> this is why we love Pete Lilback. He, Pete, yeah. I don't, I don't want to detract from Rachel's moment because she, she did, if, if we had the opportunity, we would say that she graduated summa cum laude. I graduated Lodi Hakum, but she, <laughs> she was summa cum laude, and, and uh, Ra Rachel didn't get A's. She got 105s, and that's, that's the kind of student she was, and so um, we're, we're just very glad at that. But Pete has been extraordinary and made a special uh, deal and wanted to do this for us, and, and so we thank him for doing this here tonight. Yeah. So now. Let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts to worship the living God. Good evening. <laughs> this is the call to worship. 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 17. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God. Stand with me as we sing together. Great is the Lord and how great is our God. Great is the Lord. 
excited to pray. I now know that a medley does indeed mean more than one. <laughs> pray with me if you will. Lord Jesus, we worship you for you are our creator, our redeemer, our prophet, our priest, and our king. Lord, we glorify you for you are absolutely holy and absolutely sovereign. Come, Lord, and send your Holy Spirit among us. Anoint us afresh, especially Dr. Lilbeck, as he preaches your word. We love you, Lord. Bless each and every believer here as we seek to know you and to glorify you in our lives more and more. Amen. Choir, would you come forward, please? beautiful melodic lines to this Irish folk song, but with such beautiful words, beautiful Savior, King of all creation.
Some of you were here when the Gordon was working us out. He was making us sweat this afternoon to, to get ready. So we thank Gordon and we all, uh, in the choir, we all just appreciate him so much because he always comes well prepared and ready to go. So thank you, Gordon. Yeah. I just want to take a minute um, to pray tonight for uh, Jesse Townsend. We mentioned him this morning. Uh, Jesse's condition has deteriorated. Uh, he may not be alive at this moment. I'm going to treat him as though he is because um, I just got word this afternoon that he was, they were going to release him to Joanne's house, the hospice house here in Bonita, but his condition was not such that they felt like they should let him travel down here. So um, we're going to pray for Jesse and Jesse's family, and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to Pete. So let's pray together. A great God, first of all, we thank you for the gift of music, and thank you that we have been blessed with so much talent in our choir and, and in our leader, in uh, Gordon and Carol. We thank you so much for them. And the joy it gives us to be able to sing praises to your name uh, in, in song. Tonight, God, our hearts are heavy for Jesse Townsend, a 30-something-year-old uh, young man with a family. And um, God, his wife has got to be wondering, well, what's next? And... And in his mind, uh, he's wondering what's next. God, we pray that in this moment, um, what could be the last moments for Jesse, we pray that you would protect his heart, that you would draw near to him, that he would, he would sense you being present and near to him. I pray that he would reach out to you and be putting his trust in you at this moment. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would keep him from fear, that you would give him a peace that passes all understanding in his heart. I would pray the same for his wife, who has to be filled with questions, anxieties, and, and just grief over the loss of her husband. God, we pray for that family, that you would bring them together, that they would be strong for one another, and that they would stand through this storm and that they would come out stronger on the other end, that they would be able to grieve and grieve deeply. Uh, God, we pray for that gift for them. And then, uh, God, our prayer is that you would be merciful and bring Jesse home quick without pain. And we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, our beloved physician and our Savior. Amen. I want to invite Pete to come, come forward and talk to us about the eternality of Almighty God. Thank you for the beautiful singing tonight. It's always a joy to teach after your heart's lifted up to heaven in joy. So thank you very much. Tonight we're talking about one of the incommunicable attributes of God. We'll say more about that as we go along. But you can see the song of Moses, the prayer of Moses, Psalm 90, is our banner head from everlasting to everlasting your God. Moses said that about uh, 3,000 years or more ago. 4,000 years, 3,500, we've got to figure out the date, but a long time back, and he believed that God had no beginning and God had no end. So as we think about this topic, then we begin to ask the question, well, then how long is eternity? The congregant asked his pastor, could you explain eternity to me? And the pastor answered, I could, but it would take me forever. <laughs> and that's actually not a joke, it's true. Because if he said, okay, now it means this next, you can't get there. So to try to understand eternity, you know, the different ways have come about. If you, can you, once you start on a circle, can you ever come to its end? Well, that's what we're thinking about here. There is no end. It just keeps on going. Um, C.S. Lewis used the illustration that time is an inch-long pencil mark on an infinitely long ream of paper going in both directions. 
So it seems like time takes forever, especially long sermons. I got the hook last week. I'm going to watch the clock better this time, <laughs> Pastor. To my deputized dean, I'm going to watch him. He's got more authority than ever tonight, so I'm in trouble. So at any rate, just an inch all the time. It doesn't matter how old do you think the universe is. If you want to give it multiple billions of years, it's just an inch on an infinite. We're talking about the difference between God and time. I heard an illustration many years ago that I've never been able to get over. And it goes something like this. There was a land where there was a giant mount like Mount Everest. And there was another land that was 10,000 miles away. And once every century, a beautiful bird would fly from that other continent to this continent and etch off just one little grain of sand off of that mountain. And then it would fly all the way back and deposit the grain. And it would do that once a century. Well, finally, after this beautiful bird had done it so many times that this entire mountain was removed, and it was now a gigantic pile of granite dust, the first day of eternity had passed. Now, you know what the problem with that illustration is that time can't be used to measure eternity at all. It falls flat. We can't comprehend something that is without beginning, that is without end. And so as we think about key themes on the eternality of God, we stop and think about our triune God. This is the classic illustration that students learn early on in doctrine of God, theology proper. God is one. And he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but each person are distinct. They're one, but they're different. You can see that there are those three attributes in the ark, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, suggesting, if you will, what we call the incommunicable attributes of God, those attributes that God has that no one can have unless you're God. They can't be given. They cannot be communicated. And so we're going to talk briefly about them tonight. We're going to talk about the aseity of God, which we mentioned last time, and review it briefly. We're going to talk about the next step of how does that doctrine of the self-existence of God, the from himselfness, as the word aseity means, how it is related to time. We'll look at some of the biblical revelation as it deals with the eternality of God. And then we'll want to think about the everlasting gifts of the everlasting God of the Bible, the what everlasting things... The everlasting God shares with we as people. And so we think about then the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit as these three persons. So everything we're going to say about eternality tonight deals with each of the three persons of the, of the Godhead. God is one. He subsists in three persons that are equal in power and glory. So a key concept of the eternality of God, and here... Uh, Dr. Poland was uh, mentioning this very helpfully this morning in the Sunday school class. If you were there, you had heard uh, some of these thoughts, and I review them here. But what we want to say then is that God's uncommunicable attributes, those that belong to him as God, they cannot be shared with anyone because they're the property of God himself. They, nevertheless, they inform all of his other attributes, attributes that he can share with others, which we call his communicable attributes look at those briefly, but the classic question of the shorter catechism is, what is God? And if you have memorized the shorter catechism and answered question four, you know more theology than most ministers who preach on Sunday. It is one of the most magnificent, succinct summaries of who God is ever composed. God is a spirit. That is, he is not made of material things. He is immaterial. He transcends the spiritual world. And he has three properties, infinite, that is, with respect to space. There's no space where he is. In fact, he's outside of space. Space exists within him. Eternal, time does not exist outside of God. It exists within God. He's outside of time. And he's unchangeable. That is, there is no perfection that is lacking in God whatsoever. He's utterly perfect, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. These are the properties that make God to be God, that God has by his very being, and he doesn't give them to anyone else because either you have them or you don't. 
for his incommunicable attributes. But notice how question number four goes on to add this little phrase, in his. In other words, it's saying if you understand those three properties of God, then you must understand that they will shape his other properties. His incommunicable attributes will define what his communicable attributes are, which are being wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, which means that you have being, I have being. By God's grace, we're growing a little bit in wisdom, especially if we read the Bible. God has wisdom. We, do. we have power, not like anybody of the a heavenly realm, but, you know, you can drive your Camaro down the road. You can do some weightlifting. Holiness. We begin to grow in sanctification. We can seek justice, what is right, giving everyone their due. Goodness and love. We can show kindness, and we can speak the truth. But the difference is, is that God in his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable nature informs every one of those qualities. So he has infinite being, infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite holiness, infinite justice, infinite goodness, and infinite truth. We can say the same thing about eternal and about his utter perfection of unchangeability. So we see then that God and his property of eternality has something that makes him utterly different from us. We are temporal. Now, one of the amazing things, because we are made in God's image, we have an eternality in our souls. We did not exist forever. But when God made us, we have a soul that will never die. We share in a being of a spiritual nature that once being, we are like God. And I remember Billy Graham saying it so many years ago, friends, you can't run from yourself. You're an eternal being. Whatever you do to yourself, harm yourself, blind yourself, get away from everything, you can't get rid of yourself. You're stuck with yourself forever. You have an eternal soul. That soul will continue. It has the likeness of God. So there's a sense in which your eternality becomes a property of human beings into the unending future because we're made in God's image. Let's review. What is a seity? Well, this phrase of a seity is something that it's at the core of how the founding faculty member of Westminster, Cornelius Van Til, loved to teach. Perhaps you're aware of his famous blackboard. He would start every lecture. I only knew him as a retired uh, statesman, so I never had him in a class. But the portrait of him at Westminster, which is in Machen Hall, has a large circle in chalk behind him with two lines and a little circle. And according to all the students that had him, he never began a lecture without drawing that circle. He said, the large circle represents God, who is absolutely self-contained, self-sufficient, undependent on anyone. And from him flows everything else. And he says, you must understand the difference between the creator and the creature if you don't get that right, Van Til would say, you can't think one thought correctly. Everything you think is wrong because you don't understand who the creator is and how everything is dependent upon his creation, his providence, his revelation. And so the distinction, this big circle is the non-Christian. Everything is one. We're all just in a material world and that's all there is. For Van Til, aseity was the foundation and beginning. God is from himself utterly distinct, and his famous phrase is the self-contained ontological triune God of Scripture. God is fully sufficient for himself. He is pure being. He is three in one, and this is the God the Bible presents. Now, John Frame, the uh, theologian that I quoted, I'll quote him again for summary, he says, God's aseity means that he is sufficient to himself, independent of anything outside himself. The Bible teaches God's aseity by saying that he does not need anything beyond himself. That's the preaching of Paul at the Areopagus in Acts 17. So aseity marks the great difference between creator and creature. But it also guards God's freedom to enter the creation without compromising himself, to enter relationships with the world and with people. So he saves us from sin, not because he needs to do it, but because of his free gift of grace. God doesn't need us, but he desires us, and he loves us by a free act of grace. And that makes his grace even more amazing. God didn't say, boy, I'm so lonely. I better save a few people. 
He said, I, I choose to love, and he loves his own. So aseity then, if we understand it properly, mandates this incommunicable property of eternality. God must transcend time. So God's self-existence, aseity, leads us to eternality, as Frame goes on to say. God's eternality is his aseity with respect to time, and therefore his lordship over time. Because he is the creator of time, he stands above it but enters it freely to do his will. In what ways? One, he has no beginning or end, so he's eternal. Time does not measure his existence. He is not changed by time. He's immutable. I love that phrase. I think it goes back to Abraham Lincoln. It's called the silent artillery of time. You begin to see it every time you look at your portrait every five years. Boy, it's blasting. I haven't heard it, but boy, it's your chipping away. More wrinkles up there, little changes. God is immutable. Time doesn't change who he is. He is equally conscious of past, present, and future. Omniscience. He is not limited by the passing of time and what he can accomplish because he's omnipotent. So God has no beginning. He has eternality. Interesting, in the beginning, God was already there. God's before the beginning because he's eternal. When God revealed himself, as we studied last time, he gave himself the name of the I am that I am, the great name Yahweh in Hebrew. Uh, we see it as the capital four letters L-O-R-D in modern translations of the Bible, the one that lives always in the present tense. He's not limited by time. Moses' prayer, Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Isaiah 40, 28, the Lord is the everlasting God. We can think about the fact that he has no end. In Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. God is there at the beginning, and there's no end for him. God transcends time because he is, in fact, the first and the last. I think we were singing that tonight, if I heard right. Isaiah loves this. I give you these verses here. I'll just read the first one, the theme. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. He is the first and the last because he is outside of time. We see that uh, God in Christ transcend time because this language of eternality is shared by both Father and Son. In Revelation 1.8, we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A and Z of the Greek alphabet. Okay, from A to Z. He's the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Past, present, and future. He's the Almighty because he is the I am. Interestingly, in Revelation 1.17, same chapter, when I saw him. Now, this is the vision of the glorified Christ. John says, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He takes the very name of God to himself because he is one with God. Revelation 22 will apply the same language at the beginning of the book that God uses of himself, the Alpha and Omega. He says, Behold, I am coming soon. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so we see even the Holy Spirit as well transcends time. With the Father and the Son, the Spirit has no beginning and is described as eternal. He shares this attribute in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. We find that the Spirit is there at the beginning, is part of the creation. And so the fact that God is one, but yet his Spirit is present, and of course, John will explain that when God speaks, that's the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The triune God is there at the very beginning of the Bible. At the beginning, they're eternal. We find this specifically said in Hebrews 9.14, that the Spirit is called the eternal Spirit. We're bringing Christ to sacrifice. In Galatians 6.8, we are told that the Spirit is the one who gives eternal life. How can he give eternal life if he's not eternal? 
That's a property. And, of course, that raises our next point. What does the eternality of God mean for us as followers of Christ? As we are his sheep, following him as our master, what does that mean for us? If this is who God is, what does that property of God mean for us as those that follow him? Well, God's everlasting nature brings us everlasting blessings. Let me say that again. God's everlasting nature brings us everlasting blessings. Who God is shapes what he does and how he provides for us. If we understand how wonderful God's nature is, you're going to understand why he gives such wonderful blessings because they're consistent with who he is. An everlasting God gives everlasting gifts to those that follow him. We can summarize several of them this way. What are these benefits for the followers of Christ? The eternal God is your dwelling place. Where do we live? What's your address? You need to start writing it down in the I am that I am. Do you ever sign your address that way? <laughs> Try that on your income tax return. You'll get arrested. <laughs> but it will be a witness for you. I'll sure, I guarantee it. Okay? How about? We have an eternal home. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and afterwards I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Wow. Ecclesiastes 12.5 says, when we finally wear out and we go away, man goes to his eternal home. And those are ominous words, because what is that eternal home? Grace and righteousness yield eternal life. Faith in Christ provides eternal life. Sovereign grace, God's sovereignty is God, appoints his people to eternal life. Acts 13, 48. God accomplishes eternal purposes. God has known his purposes before time. Stop and think about that. You ha he has chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. More secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior. In love, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son, adopting them as sons. That's extraordinary. Christ's blood of sacrifice brings eternal redemption. Isn't it great that your redemption doesn't run out of gas after a century, after a millennia, after a little bit of eternity? It's, it's eternal. Redeemed forever. Entrance is into, Peter will tell us, an eternal kingdom. That's what we have looking forward to. Those are some of the blessings. Now, the biblical words that are translated as eternal, everlasting, and forever are worthy of careful study, and I can only say a little bit because I don't want to do too much of a Greek and Hebrew exercise tonight. But there are three Hebrew words that do come to bear, the least used one, as far as I can tell, is the word that means sometimes east or ancient. Kind of like when, when you looked at to the east in Israel, you looked up to the mountains. You know, the lowland is the sea. It's kind of like the eternal mountains in the distance. So the east became the ancient. And, of course, the civilizations from the far east that were out there, the rising of the sun, that is the word that is used in Deuteronomy 33:27 when it says we make our dwelling in the eternal God. Another key word is the word olam, which means forever or vast length of time. And this is the word that is most often used in our Old Testament text that we're looking at tonight. There's one other one, leodek yamim, which means length of days. And that's the one that we have in our beloved Psalm 23, 6. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord it doesn't say olam. It says this phrase, la odek yamim. It means for the length of days. So as long as days are, I'm going to be in God's house. Not as long as I have days. But as long as there are days, I will be in God's house. It's an expression of a vast time of life. Now, the Greek word for everlasting is one you actually know. Have you ever used the word eon? It took eons to get the answer from uh, Amazon when I called about my order. It took eons more before they refunded my money. We, you use the word. That's the word forever. 
Ionion, from which we get the English word eon, means an indefinite and very long period of time, was actually used in classical philosophy to explain the power existing from eternity in the supreme being. That word is carried over into New Testament use. Now, as we wrap up our time, I've got to watch out because my deputized dean has a really sharp hook tonight. I've got 15 minutes to try to cover these six everlasting blessings. Now, I showed you there's a bunch of them, but I decided to highlight a handful that maybe would be encouraging for us tonight. Remember the argument, if God is everlasting, this property of God that is his incommunicable attributes, one of them means that he gives the same kind of blessings to us as people who have been given eternal soul. We get these kind of eternal blessings that are consistent with his nature. So what might we do? Okay, what does a candle evoke? Have you ever been to a wedding when two candles come to one? I thought that would be a good symbol of love. Do you know there's everlasting love? That lady really looks happy tonight. She could be singing in the choir there, I think. She looks so happy. Well, she looks like she's filled with a lot of joy. How about that? Have you ever seen a cairn when you go out hiking? It marks a way. Do you know there's an everlasting way? How about that? A cross that brings everlasting life. Now, this one you might not know so well, but, you know, church historians have to put a little church history into their teaching. This is called the Luther Rose. And if you look carefully from the inside out, Luther said, this is how I would like my theology be to be symbolized. A black cross showing human sin that requires the death of Christ. And then a heart that is red with life, with mortification and a new life given by Christ that's filled with if you will, a blossom of whiteness, purity, the realm of the angels that leads to the blue of the heavenly hope until you come to the golden circle of the kingdom of God. Isn't that a great theology? We ought to make more of the Luther Rose. We don't do enough with it. You know, uh, I'd love to see some of you wear Westminster pins. If I could get Paul Koyster to wear one, it'd be a real victory, but I'm not holding out for that tonight. But a Luther Rose would look good on him, I think, right? It really would. Okay. We, maybe, maybe my dean needs one of those. What do you think? <laughs> my good. He might give me five more minutes to talk if I gave him one. Okay. But let that represent the kingdom, the kingdom of God, an eternal kingdom. And then how about that? That represents the covenant, an eternal covenant. Tonight, these six things are worthy of your reflection because they are six everlasting gifts that the God who's from everlasting to everlasting is giving to you. Wasn't that worth coming tonight just to hear that? That's the blessing. That's your takeaway. You are everlasting because you're created in God's image and your everlasting God has gifts that are just like him that match the nature that he's given you and they're yours forever. That makes every possible bad day ahead seem just a little bit better if we would remember those things. Let's take a look. Everlasting love. Jeremiah 31.3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Isaiah 54.8, in overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Deuteronomy 10, 15. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples, as you are this day. And I use that one because we know God's choice was before the foundation of the world. It represents everlasting love. We can see more there. Everlasting joy, how about this? This is one of my favorite texts of the Bible, Isaiah 35, 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah 61, 7. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. Of course, that suggests something of the new heavens and the new earth. 
Notice 2 Thessalonians 2, and the same thing. Now may our, God, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Have you thought about the eternal comfort that you have? We don't talk much about that. Because you have eternal joy, you have eternal comfort. When you, when you say, I'm enjoying myself, I'm filled with joy, no, nothing's really bothering me. That is, if you will, the flip side of eternal joy. It's a description of Revelation 21, verses 3 to 5, where it reminds us of that great kingdom of God where he will wipe away every tear and death will be no more. There'll be no mourning, crying, nor pain anymore for the former things will have passed away. The everlasting way. Psalm 139, 24. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way we walk today is an everlasting road. Psalm 139 is about an intimate communion with God. It's one of the most beautiful I and thou's prayers in the Bible. God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. And he's saying, search me, know me. Because I want to walk in this everlasting way. It's kind of like that great story. Do you remember the Sunday school story? That little boy <clears throat> who was learning about the story of Enoch. And say Enoch was no more. And he said, how did that happen? He said, well, I think it was like this. Enoch got to know God so well that one day they were walking. He said, you know, you're closer to my home than yours. Why don't you just come home with me? He was walking in the everlasting. That's the way it ought to be with saying, you know, one day I'm going to take my last step, and the next one is into the presence of God. I've been walking this road. It's an everlasting way. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. Find rest for your souls. The word ancient here is the word eternal, everlasting way. So sometimes I see people using this of for the uh, great Puritan writers or Luther, the reformers. That's true. But really it says the ancient path is the way of walking intimately with God that Enoch walked in and pleased God. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. You have an everlasting way. And now what is striking and startling, and we must not run from it, the Bible makes it clear that there is everlasting life, but it's coupled with everlasting judgment. Dr. James Kennedy wrote a book on truths that transform, and he had a chapter called The World's Most Unpopular Subject. And it's a four-letter swear word that's a theological verity. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. There is a danger of the soul. Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Did you happen to see the news recently that one of the uh, great Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young composers just died? The day before, I can't remember which one. Some of you might be able to help me. Okay. He said, heaven is way overrated. He died the next day. I wonder if he still thinks that. That's the issue. There's an eternity. There's an everlasting life. And there's an everlasting judgment. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said, And those will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Second Thessalonians 1, 9, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Those words should motivate us to share our faith faithfully, regularly, and earnestly because of the great life that we have in Christ and the great danger that awaits those who enter eternity 
without knowing a savior. This is what motivated evangelists throughout the ages to go to missions fields because they said it's worth dying if I can rescue some from an eternity under the wrath of God. John 3, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This most popular of all verses that's seen in football stadiums written on athletes' foreheads that are spoken by Sunday school kids and preached from pulpits around the globe almost every Sunday somewhere. It says people perish too. That's the reality of why the good news really is the good news. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I could preach long on that verse, but let me note that no one goes to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus. They go to hell because they're under the wrath of God for sin. And they did not take the only cure. Yes, if you don't believe in Jesus, you will be lost, but it's not because you didn't believe in Christ. It's because you didn't have a Savior that can save you from sin. There is no other way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The judgment of God is already upon us because we have already fallen in Adam. We are a fallen race. We are in broken covenant life everywhere. And we need to have the good news given to us to be rescued. Yes, there's an everlasting kingdom. Now, my type is getting really small here. Sorry about that. But it says in Daniel 2.44, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. In chapter 4, verses 3 and 34, how great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Do you know who said those words? It's Nebuchadnezzar the king. He said, you think I have a kingdom? This one has a real kingdom. In Daniel 6, 26, for he is the living God Enduring forever, his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. You know, some people are wondering, will the American empire survive? Will our experiment in the Republican form of government endure? We see all the issues. I want to assure you it will not survive. I have no idea when it will end. But this world will all perish. But you have been given a kingdom that will never end. Hitler boasted about his kingdom that would last a thousand years that lasted maybe 15 years. The American empire, I hope, lasts a thousand years, but it may not. But as much as I love America, praise God for this kingdom that is everlasting. This is your kingdom given by your king. In 2 Peter 1 verse 11, it says, For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there is a rich provision for your coming into the kingdom. I'm reminded here of, of some uh, ways in which Christian workers often feel disappointed. I hope Pastor John doesn't ever feel like he's been overlooked for his faithfulness. We just gave it an award out in his honor tonight, so he ought to feel at least a little bit better, right? So hopefully he doesn't feel burned out. There's a great story about a missionary who came home. And as he arrived in the port, I think it was New York City, there were bands playing, there were crowds that were there. And as he came there, he thought, wow, the people have turned out to welcome me home after all these years of sacrificing in Africa. And when he came out, he discovered there was a movie star on board and everybody was there for him. And when he came out, no one even meted him at the gangplank. He was disappointed for a minute. And then the thought came to him. He said, yeah, but I'm not home yet. This says there's going to be a rich welcome of your entrance into the eternal kingdom as you serve the Lord. You know, that's why Christians can work in humble places, little places, and give it all they got. Because they're not doing it for fame. They're doing it for the king, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews says, 
He is not so unjust to forget the labor that you've done for him. He will honor his servants, and that's the beautiful thing. That's why he, Jesus said not even a cup of water given in his name will ever lose its reward. I'm tempted to preach there, but i got to keep going. I see the hook coming out, so forgive me. First Peter 5.10 says this, And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The old hymn says, It will be worth it all when we see Christ. The sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, the Apostle Paul says in his magisterial hymn of the great blessing of Romans chapter 8 in the eschaton. Well, lastly, the everlasting covenant. Genesis 9, 16, when the bow, bow is in the clouds, I will see it. Remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. We live every day, even though we see the Gulf of Mexico creeping up into basements and living rooms here in Naples and Bonita Springs and Fort Myers, there will not be a universal flood. The Lord said, no, it won't happen. I will stop it. That is a covenant that lasts as long as the earth. But that covenant is a taste of a far greater covenant of Genesis 17, 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. God says, I'm here to the end of history for the people who follow me or in my covenant. I will not abandon you. I will not leave you. My covenant is intact. Jeremiah 32, 40, I will make with them an everlasting covenant. Isaiah 55, 3, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. Psalm 89 describes this love for David. He says, but I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. Jesus Christ is the great David, and we have our covenant securely kept in him. And so finally, this is an interesting verse that, I think is typically overlooked in this context. Look at carefully at Philemon 1, verse 15. You remember the story of the runaway slave that is brought back? When he comes back, he's now a Christian. Paul's giving him a letter of entrance and say, when the runaway slave comes back, don't think of him as just a slave. Think of him as a family member. He now knows Jesus as his Savior. He says, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a loved brother. He doesn't say, so you might have him back for a decade or two more of good service. So you have him forever. Our brotherhood in Christ lasts forever. No, that's why you ought to get along with one another. You're going to have to spend all eternity together. Have you thought about that? The covenant's eternal. We're all part of the family. We belong to each other. And that's why we ought to be able to pray sincerely what we prayed this morning in worship. Forgive me, even as I forgive others. Why? Because they are our forever family. And we've got to make it work. By grace, we can. Well, as we've considered the aseity and eternality of God, this leads us to the wonderful truth we'll consider next, the God who provides. He surely can provide for he is self-existing creator who from his eternal love can and will provide all we need. So like any good radio show, tune in next week, same place, same time, <laughs> and we'll talk about the God who provides. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to reflect on these wonderful truths of your word. You are the God we cannot understand. You are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And yet, you brought these great gifts of your eternality to us that we might share in your blessings. Would you send our friends, our brothers and sisters home tonight 
with a sense of the everlasting love that is theirs, a sense of the everlasting joy that they can participate in as they look to you. We pray, Lord, that they would remember, if they're not believers, that they can have an everlasting life and that they would walk in this everlasting way that leads to your everlasting kingdom because your everlasting covenant will never be broken. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for loving us. We pray this in your matchless and eternal name. And that's the other reason why we love Pete. Um, so I have a few things I need to say. First of all, I thought I sensed a ripple of panic that went through the congregation when I said that I've been made dean at Westminster. It, it, that position is, is such that I can carry it out right from here. And I don't have to leave my current position and I don't have to move to Philadelphia in order to do it. And so, actually, Pete was wanting to take it away from me by the end of the service today. And I told him I wouldn't give it up. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's, uh, it's sort of an honorary position. But I noticed you didn't ask me about my I-9. <laughs> <laughs> um, on your way out tonight... On the credenza, there is the Westminster Magazine. Pete sent those down. There's enough for one for everybody. Uh, there's some terrific articles in there, um, much of which has to do with what Westminster Seminary is referring to as public theology. Uh, how does our, um, how does our uh, faith inform our uh, political positions, our political uh, opinions, and um, and so there's a couple articles in that. Pete has an article in there. There's some really fine, fine, uh, rich, deep articles in there. And so I would invite your attention to that. You're welcome to it. Uh, there's no charge on that. And then uh, Pete, as he said, is going to be back next week talking about the provision of God. If you want slides, Pete, can I take your... Will, will you have those? Uh, can you download those on a thumb drive? That'd be great. If you want, if you want the slides that come with that, what I need for you to do is fill out. There's a there's a white card in front of you, uh, and the chairs. If you would put your name and your email address on that, I will email you the slides from tonight, and get those to you. I also want to make a point of thanking the choir for coming early and for blessing us with that. That is a beautiful song, and we appreciate that. And I wanted to thank Carl, too, because Carl makes all this electronic stuff possible. Uh, he and his... <laughs> and his partner, Dave Schaefer. And so we thank both of those two in, um, in, in making all this possible. And he live streamed today. And if Jan Winters is still watching, there you go, Jan. And that's it. That's all that I want to say. And so we're going to conclude tonight's service with, um, stand with me. We're going to sing, Thou Art Worthy.
and now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, our Savior, be power, honor, glory, and dominion, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go safely. Go in peace. Good night.